Amendment Bill. There we go, there's the recording. Um, before we dive into today's webinar, here's a short update of South Africa's copyright reform process. So recently, on the 26th of September, 2023, the National Council of Provinces passed the Copyright Amendment Bill, uh, that is the B13F 2017. This version of the bill was arrived at after extensive public consultation across all nine provinces, as well as an incorporation of the blind essay litigation that we discussed in the previous webinar as well to update its provisions for people with disabilities. Now, the next step in the process is for the National Assembly to consider this amended bill um, and also adopt it before it then goes on to the president for his assent. So this is a document that we will be analyzing uh, in these webinars. And today's webinar takes a closer look specifically at those provisions of the bill that facilitate the free flow of information, as well as those provisions that deal with language translations. The webinar highlights two central and somewhat interrelated aspects of the rights in the Bill of Rights. That is, first, the right to freedom of expression, in particular, the freedom to impart and receive information. And second, language rights. The webinar aims to answer the following questions. How does the Copyright Amendment Bill give effect to these rights? And also, to what extent can copyright holders also exercise these rights alongside the users of materials under copyright? And where does fair use fit into this, fit into this discussion, if at all? So let's dive into today's webinar. We've got two speakers. The first speaker for today talking to us about the freedom of information and copyright is Professor Tobias Schoenwetter. Prof. Schoenwetter is an associate professor in the Department of Commercial Law at the University of Cape Town. He's also the director of the Faculty's Intellectual Property Unit and the founding director of the Faculty's Intaka Center for Law and Technology. He teaches intellectual property and information technology law and currently leads several development and innovation-oriented research and capacity building projects, including particularly the Open African Innovation Research Network, Open Air. You must have seen it being advertised a lot. They do a lot of work on um, uh, a free and fair copyright across the world. Uh, Prof. Schoenwetter regularly ad uh, advises various government and non-government entities on issues relating to intellectual property, and in particular, open access and copyright. The second speaker for today is Professor Klaus D. Bater, who's talking to us about language rights and copyright. Professor Bater is a full professor at the Faculty of Law of Northwest University in Purchestrom. He teaches LLB and LLM modules in intellectual property law, socioeconomic rights, and international social justice. His research focuses on the right to education, higher education, education law, the right to science, more recently, science law, academic freedom, which is what his inaugural professorial lecture was on, intellectual property rights, especially copyright law, extraterritorial application of human rights, the right to development, and particularly for today's webinar, Law and Language. He's a member of the Consortium for Human Rights Beyond Borders in Heidelberg, an advisor to the Global Right to Education Initiative in London, and one of 16 ambassadors to the Observatory Magna Carta Universitatum in Bologna, and occasionally a consultant to UNESCO as well. So thank you so much from our side to Professor Schoenwetter and Prof. Beter for joining us today. I'd like to invite Prof. Sean Vetter to begin your presentation. Tobias, whenever you're ready, please begin. We'll have 15 minutes first uh, with you, and then we'll hand over to Klaus, and then I'll open the floor for Q&A. Um, so please begin whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm ready, Sanya. So let's uh, let's get going. Um, I just learned a new feature on Zoom, so I'll try to replicate what we, <laughs> we tried just about five minutes ago. And while I play around with technology here, I want to start off by thanking the Mandela Institute, of course, and uh, Bijip for, for organizing this uh, today. And uh, in particular, you, uh, Dr. Sanya, for, for putting this all together and, and getting us here in one place at the same time. And, and welcome, of course, to everybody who's joining from close or afar. OK, so I'm supposed to press this button. And then you should be seeing, hopefully, my presentation. Yes, everything Sonia, works you... fine. Everything works well. Everything is perfect. Okay, so here you can see uh, the title of today's session again, uh, Copyright Law for Language Translations and the Free Flow of Information. Um, as was uh, just, just said, um, I will be focusing on the latter part. 
first, and then uh, Professor Beta is going to take over and uh, is, is going to to delve into the issue of language translations in a in a little bit more detail. Um, but uh, because I've spoken recently quite often about this, and I kind of uh, also try to figure out what uh, what what touches people's nerves when I talk about these issues, I want to actually repeat something that I um, that I not always talk about, but I think we. Uh, uh, it might be useful for, to, for today's framing. So in, in terms of expanding the context a little bit more than, than what we just heard, I wanted to take you through my own history of how I actually got involved in this work because it actually kind of now illuminates in, uh, in, in where we are finding ourselves. M many, many years ago, I started this. And when I actually started this, um, the conventional uh, narrative of intellectual property, um, including copyright, was was very much still back then that just having strong levels of intellectual property protection and um, intellectual property enforcement uh, in a country uh, will sort everything out and everything else will flow from there and everything will be good. Creators uh, and rights holders will be happy and they will thrive and the economy will grow and innovation will happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, me as someone hailing from from a global north country, uh, Germany in this case, I, I very much subscribed to 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 this narrative, believed in this um, when I uh, came to South Africa, and and still the world looked like what you're seeing there in front front of uh, in front of you at the moment. But then, relatively early on in my um, in my research, I came across this map um, and um, or this depiction of. Um, of the world, I should rather say. And you can obviously immediately notice there's something markedly different between what you just saw here and what you see on this map. And this is that essentially the global south sort of disappears. Uh, I guess uh, if you follow that one uh, little string of red there, uh, that probably would lead you right to Sandton in Johannesburg or something. But but other than that, there's not much left of, of the African continent and, and of other parts uh, in, in the global south. Um, so I ask typically my students, what what do you what do you think you're seeing here? And uh, they come up with all sorts of things. Uh, carbon com uh, emissions, for example, <laughs> is one of them, and I think that's probably also true. Um, but uh, that, that, that would not, not have steered me in any way in my work. But uh, what this really depicts is royalty flow, IP royalty flows. So it's basically the money, where the money ends up from IP royalties. And that means that a lot of money is going from the poorest countries really to, to the richest countries. And, um, and I, I saw this map and I was like, oh, any system, any framework really that makes that happen needs to be interrogated a little bit further because something is not quite, quite right here. Um, that's a strange uh, system created uh, by by law. And then I also started to listen to, uh, heard more and more people complaining about what you basically see depicted in this uh, little cartoon here in front of you, where people started to complain that, well, in terms of innovation kind of dynamics and the way that innovation really happens and that you're often built on what others have, have done before, there is a, there's a problem. Um, because it seems that by ever increasing um, all types of IP protection, um, you are actually doing away with a very rich and important source of uh, or building block for for innovation. Um, so if you if you just look at the uh, the pictures here, it says on the left hand side, traditionally we had a very thin layer of intellectual property protection, and that includes copyright protection, and that surrounded a large and rich public domain of stuff, of information, of knowledge that was freely available to everybody to build up. Um, that kind of thin layer of intellectual and copyright protection didn't cover very much and it didn't cover it for very long. Um, and that was for the longest time uh, of human history. And uh, in the last uh, um, uh, 100, 150 years or so, that balance, according to some at least, has somewhat kind of is out, is out of whack between uh, what the, the balance between what is and isn't protected has, has been completely changed. And and according to at least the ones that uh, that um, believe in in the slide, say that is crushing creativity. And uh, while I'm not fully agreeing with that, it also continued that thought process uh, that I had at, that I had started when I first saw um, yeah the map that I showed you um, a little bit earlier. So I really started to wonder what and if we have all these different narratives about the prospects and the benefits of strong IP protection. Was on the one side, and then kind of this criticism on the other side. I wanted to really find out what is then the relationship between IP protection, innovation, and development. Uh, and um, really, ever since, 
um, I, I've, I've done research projects with, with many, many colleagues on that. And I also have started, and I think this is also perhaps an interesting point to make, I've also started to listen to people outside the, the legal fraternity. Um, it's good to listen to people from other disciplines of what they actually think of, of the systems that we are talking about. So econo economists are good people to listen to, I guess, sometimes when, it's go, when, when you talk about growing the economy, about development and all these things. And there's just no way of not getting to the writings of Joseph, uh, Professor Joseph Stieglitz at some point, who um, is an economist, or obviously a Nobel Prize winner in, in, in that. And but he is interested in intellectual property and he is fairly skeptical too. Um, and this is now kind of, now we are kind of approaching the actual um, topic of today because he also speaks about the knowledge economy and making knowledge available. Um, and uh, let me read out this quote here from, from him. He says, if the knowledge economy and economy of ideas is to be a key part of the global economy, and if static societies are, be trans uh, are to be transformed into learning societies that are key for growth and development, then there is a desperate need to rethink the current intellectual property regime and to allow for a much less restrictive flow of information and knowledge. So you read this, you continue reading, and then you also hear all these uh, um, anecdotal stories about uh, um, countries that at some point of their own development, making that leap from being a developing country to a developed country, um, they seem to have benefited from uh, comparably low levels of IP protection. So um, Harvard professor Ruth Okadichi came to Cape Town a couple of years ago, 2019, did a presentation for us, and she was um, making the same point that many others have also made in, in, in a similar uh, way. And she was uh, pointing out to us that early copyright uh, statutes in the U.S., limited copyright protection quite, quite dramatically and also uh, in, in that they only gave that protection to domestic authors um, and uh, the citizens of the US had the right to copy works published in foreign uh, countries and then as a young newly independent nation low-cost access to European literature was recognized as essential to the country's development. Um, again she's Definitely not uh, not the only one. There's uh, similar examples from from South Korea, I, I believe, and and some other countries. And um, and then I'm stopping here my little literature review, I guess. But I just want to bolster uh, the points up a little bit that I'm making here. This is a uh, 20 years old, I guess, 20, 2002 2003 UK Commission on Intellectual Property Rights. No worries, I'm not going to read this all out to you. I'm sure there will be one way or the other to circulate this presentation here. But again, what it does contain. Are num uh, numerous recommendations that emphasize the need in, the develop in developing countries to not only uh, adequately uh, also increase and improve the levels of protection, but also to improve access to copyrighted materials and information, for example, through broader copyright exceptions such as the use, um, and especially in the digital space. And that is to be done in the development uh, interest of the developing countries. So I, I really, I mean, it's as I said, it's a, it's a, it's not the new source, but but some of those discussions uh, are still hovering around uh, what you find in that report. So I, I if you haven't read it yet, uh, it's uh, I kind of make it a prescribed reading in a way. Um, here are some of the outputs that we have then since then sort of created two that are relevant for what I'm talking about today. Um, the one uh, research project that we did. Uh, was specifically on access to knowledge in Africa and the role that copyright um, plays in that. And uh, the other one is, was then a little bit broader, broadening to other forms of intellectual property as well, and also bringing innovation dynamics in, into the fray. But uh, mainly here, the, the point of the slide is to alert you that this is based on research and not being made up um, as we speak. The one key thing here in the interest of time also, because I could speak about this easily for the next three hours or so, but I think the main key takeaway for this is that I think um, if everybody goes away from these presentations and says that the ultimate aim of copyright is actually to create that optimal balance between rights holders rights on the one hand and uh, and, and, and user um, interests and uh, in particular um, uh, copyright ex exceptions and limitations then we have really uh, achieved a lot so that also uh, adequate access to information is uh, being safeguarded, which, by the way, as I said earlier, is often the building block for follow on uh, creativity anyways. Um, the interesting part here is that that the balance is not the same in all countries. And I think this is why uh, um, 
our conversations here in South Africa ought to be different from conversations that uh, that happened elsewhere because the context just differs. I mean, but in, in fact, I believe in many ways that South African context differs from from all other contexts because it's diffi difficult to place South Africa in 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 the developing or developing uh, developed country context. Yes, we absolutely we are by all intents and purposes and metrics a developing country. Um, but we also have these pockets of high, high development. So now how to balance that uh, is, is a challenge. And it's a challenge that, uh, that our lawmaker had to confront, uh, was confronted with when, uh, when engaging in, in, in copyright reform. So it's all about balancing the interest in the field. And this is not unlike of what we see in the constitution that we heard already earlier, but also in human rights uh, um, uh, kind of instruments. Now, I'm not going to talk much about that because I'm feeling that there's better suited people here on this panel today to talk about human rights. But I mean, if I just look at art, uh, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, you can see this, the, if you look at the two different paragraphs, the one is, yes, all about the right of protection of the moral and material interests that result from uh, productivity of and uh, and, and, and authors. But I find it actually from the outset quite interesting. This is the second uh, paragraph, right? The first one is the is kind of the other side of the balance of the point that every everyone should also have the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and and its benefits. And that's the access dimension of, of the whole discussion, I'd I'd say. Um, and as a result, I think, um, and I think it's uh, not uh, enough uh, recognized, we have, uh, even though it's only a phase one um, of the IP policy, is, uh, is um, we have an IP policy and that IP policy also has objectives. And in those exact uh, objectives, uh, fairly early on in, in the document, it also talks about striking a balance between the owners and uh, users of IP. So we should not forget that whatever is being done in the area, in any area of, of intellectual property, really should also be informed by what uh, what is contained in that 2018 uh, document. So, um, long story short, let's delve into copyright law now um, in, in a bit more detail. There was all that frame setting, and I'm just assuming that everybody knows the basic of copyright laws. Uh, I have a one side slum summary here if you ever need one. So this is kind of a, a one sentence uh, summary that copyright laws around the world operate in the way that the moment something that is creative is being created, the creators of that work get a time limited monopoly that allows them to decide if and how others can use the, uh, this work. So that's the overall uh, definition. And then you have here in South Africa, a list of uh, protected works, creative protected works. And then um, you have uh, a set of rights in relation to these different types of works that only the rights holder um, uh, has. Duration depends on the nature of the work, but rule of thumb here in South Africa, 50 years after the death of the author. Key takeaway also, no registration necessary. So something is protected automatically the moment something is being created and that creates some of the access challenges that we are facing and we, that we sort of need to overcome uh, through legal mechanisms uh, like the copyright exceptions and limitations that I will be talking in the last few minutes of my presentation. Bottom line is what uh, copyright presents us is a default and automatic all rights reserved situation. And that means that permission is really required for most users, regardless of whether the work, the, the author, the rights holder is easy to locate it or whether it's easy to contact the owner, et cetera. Permission is in most cases uh, required. So how then do we uh, make sure that uh, we are speaking to that other side of the balance uh, equation that I showed there. We really not only provide all the protection that copyright provides uh, the, the rights holder with, but also uh, that we make sure that, that there's a sufficient flow of information and access to knowledge. And this is where copyright exceptions and limitations mainly come in. And it's not something obscure. <laughs> um, as far as I know, all countries have copyright exceptions uh, in the world. So it's not so much, at, um, and you can see the definition for uh, for copyright exceptions uh, there at the bottom. So it's not so much a question as to whether or if we should have uh, exceptions and limitations, but how we deal with them really. And I've, I've done similar presentations before, and I know the methodologies 
tend to differ a little bit. I'm still very much subscribed to what I think are the three main ways of dealing with exceptions and limitations. I think it kind of uh, um, brings a couple of key messages home quite nicely. Um, they are overlapping, but if you were to take them apart, you could either do it by way of long, very specific lists of exceptions and limitations, like Germany and many countries in, in, um, in Europe actually do. You can, you can choose a fair use provision that what South Africa is not trying to, uh, to get into or is, going, is, is getting. And um, the current status quo yet, the fair dealing provision, the third uh, approach, where um, uh, um, uh, I should perhaps cycle one back, the fair use provision basically being a, a broad provision um, that uh, generally allows um, the permission for use of copyrighted goods as long as the use is deemed to be fair. And I'll show you later how this is being determined. And then the kind of fair dealing approach also consists of one broader provision but much more narrow in the way that it's it's confined to to narrow subset of purposes really, and then uh, a, a shorter list of more specific uh, exceptions and limitations, and that is what we currently have in South Africa. So one has to uh, resist the temptation, I guess, to see fair dealing as a nice kind of compromise between the other two. It's like I have, I have, I've spoken about this so many times and everybody was, first people are like, oh no, this sounds great. You take a little bit of fair use and then a little bit from the list. But it's actually not so much combining the best of both worlds, but very much the worst of both worlds in my case, in my opinion, in that it's way too narrow in that the broader provision that we have in the law is just not broad enough in the way that the purposes are so so, so narrow. And then the list that is provided for uh, for legal specificity, which in principle could work quite nicely, is just too short. There's just not enough specific specificity in those in those um, uh, other provisions. So South Africa is trying very interesting new now, I guess, not rocket science, but kind of new. And that is to not do fair dealing as a compromise between fair use and long list, but actually do both. Like a hybrid, some people say. And I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that because it, it seems to, at least for now, um, and, and after having uh, given this a lot of thought, it seems to really combine the, the, uh, the benefits of, of both the flexible fair use provision um, that uh, can, be, can be also tailored to new cases if and when technology changes um, and um, also has the, the benefit of then also having, in addition to that broader fair use provision, a longer list of exceptions and limitations that provide um, more legal uh, certainty. I should probably also from time to time look at my own notes here and then I'm sure that I make all the points that I want to make, but I think I've more or less more or less covered that three approaches the one that south africa has the one on the in gray on the right hand side and then kind of that combination of existing approaches elsewhere um that that could be quite a neat way of um of also countering uh the most obvious disadvantages of either of these two approaches that are, that are being used now um over the years we had a lot of uh, noise um uh, around these changes of uh um of the copyright exceptions and limitations um if if I may, may may say this here, um, I also feel that sometimes the those that are the loudest uh, seem to know the least um, about copyright in that area, but they can write beautiful uh, op eds um, uh, at times. But it's it's sometimes uh, just uh, just off in in a way. You need to understand how copyright really works to um, uh, to engage with with it uh, meaningful. Well, I guess, and you need to understand also the different approaches to copyright exceptions and limitations, um, and um, the. The, the focus here today is that there's some expansion of the of these exceptions and limitations, but it's not some evil plot to uh, to take away rights uh, from from rights holders really. But it is, and now uh, becoming serious again. It's really an attempt to recalibrate our laws, future proof uh, what's effectively 1970s piece of legislation, uh, align our law with the state of the art uh, policy discussions in the field of copyright and and really ultimately just walk that important talk of creating that fair balance between rights holders' interest and the interests of, of those who, is, who are seeking information and knowledge for whatever reason, uh, whether it's just for consumption purposes or, for, or to, to build up on what, what others uh, have, have done before. And 
um, there's, a, there's a bigger goal even behind that. And all this is done to reach our developmental objectives at the end of the day as, um, as, as a country. Um, so um, let's, uh, uh, let's assume this, this is now in the bag. Um, here you see what the most, uh, the, the changes actually will bring about, removing existing exceptions and limitations of the current act um, uh, into, into, into one place instead of uh, in various places where they applied or did not apply to certain times. It was always very confusing to explain that to people from outside South Africa, even copyright experts of how all copyright actually deals with copyright exceptions and limitations. So there is some streamlining should certainly, they have been shortened, amended and updated. Um, and we have a reasonably long list of new detailed and specific exceptions and limitations. And Professor Beta is gonna talk us uh, through some of those specific ones in terms of, uh, of translations, but also specific for education and academic activities, libraries, archives, museums, galleries, persons with disabilities. I think some of these exceptions and limitations have either already been discussed in previous talks of the series or will still be discussed in future talks. So um, for, for now, it's just, uh, just a reminder that, um, uh, that uh, these exceptions and limitations um, that, that you find now in the bill uh, are, are dealing also specifically with some of these kind of stakeholder groups. And then the, the replacement of our current fair dealing provision in section 12 of the, uh, of the Copyright Act with a new fair use provision in section 12a. And I guess this is now working a little bit text-based here. I just wanted to not, uh, not leave you. Uh, um, without having actually shown you the fair use provision as I think it now stands in the latest version of the bill. I think we had F now. I'm looking at Sanya as to when she's nodding uh, because she is following the process the closest. So this is a, this is a copy from, uh, um, from the F bill. And you can see here um, that uh, this is a key component of the bill. It allows the permission for use of, uh, of copyrighted material for the for uses such as the ones that you see here in front of you, um, uh, research, private study, personal use, criticism, reporting, current events, scholarship, teaching, education, et cetera, et cetera. And some of this is actually also a repetition of the purposes that were already previously covered by the fair dealing uh, provision. And then there was a lot of um, discussions as to whether this is limitless and bottomless and is really too much or to the detriment of, of the rights holder side of the which we must never lose sight of, of course, because ultimately we cannot balance by just completely forgetting about the one side and, and just attending uh, um, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the other side. And um, these claims have been made, but I think most who make the claim that um, fair use is uh, um, too far reaching have effectively started reading um, after the slide and have not continued to read uh, the provision, uh, which couldn't be any clearer in that um, uh, the use, it's not any use, but it needs to be a use that need, is fair, uh, considered to be fair. And uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a similar way as the uh, US uh, fair use doctrine uh, determines fairness uh, on their side, do, will we now have in our Copyright Act uh, a number of factors uh, uh, with which courts can decide on a case-to-case -case basis if it ever gets to this, or users and, and rights holders before that, uh, between themselves, determine as to whether a, a, a use in question um, is um, actually fair or not. You see here the nature of the work in question. That was beautiful with the, with the clock there. I saw that. <laughs> Sonia, I'm not sure whether that meant that the time is up or whether I have uh, two minutes. That is my last slide, though. Um, anyways. Um, nature of the work in question, amount and subst uh, substantial you know, the part of the work affected, the purpose and the character of the use, and the uh, market effect, really, the substitution effect. So the, the, there's uh, many factors to be considered before a use is really determined to be fair and therefore um, permission-free. What I have left out in the interest of time is all the discussions about the, uh, as to whether um, uh, the fair use uh, doctrine as proposed is uh, com uh, compliant with uh, international law. I have some slides after my uh, uh, thank you slide. Um, so if later on in the Q&A session that comes up, I can return to this if need be and actually tell you why I do believe that this is uh, uh, okay and fully uh, compliant with international law. I'm stopping this and I'm going to hand over to Professor Beta to 
take us further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tobias. Uh, great slides, very engaging. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Klaus to continue with your presentation. We can see your screen, so go ahead and begin. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'll roughly talk 10 minutes about the whole context uh, of the importance of language and translation in terms of human rights and uh, copyright law. And then uh, the second 10 minutes actually focus on the CAB text as uh, we have it. And there's lots of information on the, on the slides, which I'm not all going to read out, but obviously uh, one can have a look at this uh, afterwards as this is being recorded. Uh, some figures on languages, 6,700 languages worldwide, 3,000 in serious danger of disappearance. One language dies every 14 days. 40% uh, of the world's population do not have access to education in their mother tongue. While 7% of languages are used in education, 93% are not. 95% of uh, the African literature is actually in the colonial languages. And if we look at South Africa, uh, we will see that most locally produced books are in English or Afrikaans. And, uh, only 9% of revenue from book salaries derives from books in all nine official African languages combined. Fewer than 4% of all titles in the education sector are published in the African languages. Uh, I found this very interesting documentary on Carte Blanche. It is about the Hindu language, uh, the language of the sun. And this is the last speaker of the sun language, one of the languages that is protected in the constitution. There are efforts to revive this language. And that is perhaps also where the relevance of copyright now uh, comes in. Uh, what can you do for languages? I'm, I'm talking on the one hand about the endangered languages, but also about local languages, uh, which just have it very difficult, uh, you know, uh, to survive in the long term or as higher order languages. So obviously you can promote original writing in languages, but the other option is to translate materials. And that is where copyright becomes relevant. Uh, because the right to translate belongs to the holder of the original work. Now, a bit of context on the importance of the mother tongue, uh, specifically in the context of education. On this slide, you see Tove Skutnap Kangas, who's uh, one of the world's most renowned linguists. She's over 80 years now. And she says in a book on linguistic genocide in education, she says, a wrong educational language policy, that is one not based on multilingualism, with mastery of the mother tongue at its heart, is actually the most important pedagogical reason for illiteracy in the world. If we look at the South African figures, we see that more than three quarters of grade four learners cannot read for meaning. And that may have to do with the fact that there is not sufficient mother tongue education. Every second child is completely illiterate in their mother tongue after four years of schooling. So these are the figures. Um, you can read this later, but just to emphasize, the research is there. Already in the 1950s, UNESCO pointed out that mother tongue ed ed education is crucial for any other learning, also for the learning of the second language or for the learning actually of English, for example, if your mother tongue uh, is not English. Is the backing for these language rights in international law? I'm going through the next slides very quickly. Article 13 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights does not mention language rights, but um, the commentators say language rights are covered. Um, specifically covered, they are by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Religious or Linguistic Minorities. A right to mother tongue uh, education is specified there. Also at um, the level of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Hague recommendations regarding the education right of national minorities provide for language rights uh, at a pre-primary, primary, secondary, and tertiary education level. In fact, at the pre-primary and primary education levels, education should be in the mother tongue. Uh, we have uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which in Article 30 says no right uh, no minority or indigenous children shall be denied the right to use their own language. And the committee uh, has in a general comment, the committee on the rights of the child has said that uh, this actually covers education in the child's uh, own language. 
there's the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, also provides for education uh, in the mother tongue. And then, uh, as we spoke about the ICESCR, there is also this Article 151b talking about cultural rights. Uh, Tobias has mentioned uh, the equivalent provision of uh, the Universal Declaration, which also says there's a right of everyone to take part in cultural life. And uh, the committee interpreting this has said that this covers access to a way of life associated with the use of one's language. Now, let's move on to the South African Constitution, actually. Uh, the Constitution recognizes 12 official languages. We know that uh, we've got sign language since uh, September as one of the official languages. But it says uh, in the Section 6.2 that the state is obliged to elevate the status and advance the use of the indigenous languages. Uh, fourth bullet point, there is a pan-South African language board to advance the official languages, coin, number, and sign languages, and um, other languages used in South Africa, Urdu, Tamil, Greek, uh, Portuguese, German, there is a commission for the promotion of the protection of the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic uh, communities. And then very important, section 29.2, so section 29 is the right to education in the constitution, grants to everyone the right to receive education in the language or languages of choice in public educational institutions. So this is the right to choose education in your mother tongue. Article 30, a general right to use your own language in Article 31 encompasses the right of linguistic communities not to be denied the uh, language. Now, another important point, we're talking a lot about decolonization of the curriculum. Uh, this is also where language rights play a fundamental role. So uh, Mugwini in this uh, first quote says, the most fundamental, subtle, pervasive, and uh, intractable instrument of mental colonization is language. If the effects of mental colonization are to be arrested, a reaffirmation of indigenous languages is a necessity also very much in the education system. I very much like uh, the second chapter that I, I mentioned here by Mantalu and Wajit, who say that in order for knowledge appropriation to take place, you need education uh, in, the mother lung, uh, in the mother tongue. So now we move up over actually to, to the copyright. First, uh, at the international level, uh, the Berne Convention, Article 8, protects this exclusive right of making the translation. So this belongs to the copyright holder. It does not mention any of uh, the exceptions um, to which Tobias has, has referred to. So does it mean that um, there is no right uh, for users to make translations? Um, you know, the Berne Convention has a reproduction exception here in 9.2. It's got a quotation exception in 10.1 or teaching exception in 10.2, but nothing for translation. Um, Rickardson and Ginsburg, in their famous commentary, say, well, there are implied limitations and exceptions that allow translation, namely to the extent that you have those other limitations and exceptions. And that is actually uh, what you see in the Copyright Act at present in Section 12. So it says the provisions of subsections, which re refers to the fair dealing provisions, um, cover either the original language or a different language. Um, but it doesn't uh, go further. Then I should also say there is a burn appendix. I summarized the burn appendix uh, with this photo here, just to show that this uh, document is so complex, nobody really understands it. It was specifically created for developing states, allowing them to make uh, translations of whole works of purposes uh, of education. But um, all writers uh, that you can read like uh, Okediji, um, uh, etc. they say that uh, the appendix has been a failure. And uh, because it is so intricate and nobody understands it, and there are so many uh, formal procedures to be complied with, that actually only four countries in the world, it seems, really apply that uh, appendix. South Africa has not made a notification to WIPO, so officially uh, it is also not making a use of the appendix. This is quite uh, interesting because uh, when I refer to the CAB in a moment, you will see that the CAB actually includes the provisions of the Bern Appendix. Uh, on the previous slide here, I referred to Article 32, the so-called 10-year regime, which is quite important uh, in the sense uh, uh, translation, but practically it does not play a role again. It is a provision that says that after 10 years, uh, the original right holder's right to make a translation uh, expires if he or she has not made a translation by that point, but that provision is not relevant today anymore. Um, yes, so um, 
just very shortly, orthodox view of translation is that a translation is a reproduction just in another linguistic code. This is also what we maybe see in the Berne Convention, but perhaps we should see it a bit differently. Um, there is some people doing uh, research on this, uh, language experts, linguists, and uh, translation experts, who really say that um, a translation does not copy. Uh, the translation enters into a mimetic relationship that inevitably deviates from the foreign language by relying on target language approximations. Uh, so the linguistic and cultural features are sufficiently distinct to make an autonomous work. So a translation is highly transformative. And maybe if you look at the third bullet, uh, this is actually taken from a decision by the US Supreme Court, of course, a very long time ago, 1853, where it said that a translation is not a copy. So translation into another language was uh, not covered by the original right holders' rights. That is quite remarkable. The next two slides, I'll skip for the moment because I want to uh, go to the actual bill that has been formulated and uh, look at the provisions here. And one should maybe start at 12BE, which is really the translation provision. And it says here the translation of a work um, is legitimate if done by a person giving or receiving instruction, provided the translation is done for non-commercial purposes used for personal, educational, teaching, judicial proceedings, research, and other purposes, provided that such use shall be compatible with free practice and communicated to the public for non-commercial purposes. Now, I find this provision not very well drafted, but I think after all, it is better to have it than not to have it. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if uh, it would be redrafted. I would simply have drafted it. It is legitimate. Um, for a work to be translated for purposes such as, and then mention the purposes in two, and then say such use shall be compatible with fair practice. Also leave away uh, the commercial uh, purpose, because um, as you will see also when you apply the fair use test, whether use is commercial or not plays a role in deciding on whether use is fair, but uh, it actually does not mean that all commercial users will never be counted as fair. So if we look at the fair use provision that Tobias has mentioned, then it says uh, fair use um, uh, is a legitimate, legitimate if for purposes such as, and then it mentions, for example, research in one or uh, in four actually uh, education, um, it also re re refers to reporting current events, etc. One thing that I would have liked to have mentioned is also fair use for cultural literacy enrichment and entertainment purposes. However, the fact that it is not mentioned is not dramatic because the clause says for purposes such as, so that is covered. And if we now specifically look at translation also in the South African context and can consider translation into the African language, African languages that we have here and apply this fair use test, then, uh, you know, deciding on whether use is fair, looking at the nature of the work, is the work used for education counts in favor of fair use. The amount copy, well, if you translate the whole work, it might count against, but this is a holistic test, so we need to look at all the features. Uh, the purposes of the use, uh, as we said, uh, use for education, Commercial use might count against, but if we are concerned with endangered languages um, or also local languages, uh, then we must say that even commercial use will be in the public interest because it helps preserving those languages. If you look at the last point, the substitution effect, the fact that a work is translated may actually mean that it, is, it becomes of more interest in the original language because if readers know, well, the work has been translated, it must be important. I also want to read it. It actually means that the market is bigger. And as far as the translations are concerned, um, we will see that the market is quite small. Some of the neglected languages are really small. And even if you think of larger local languages, um, uh, the speakers are often very poor. So the market uh, is, is, is not very strong. So the, the substitution effect is negligible for that reason. Okay, uh, Sonia, you're probably waiting for me to, uh, to finish. Um, I could, of course, say a lot about um, the annex here, um, this uh, 
and it's about the translations. Let me just say, it is basically about um, putting the burn appendix into local law. However, on reading this, I, I see that it does not really, in all respects, comply with the provisions of the burn appendix. The time limits mentioned here um, are different. And, but as I said, uh, the burn appendix has been a failure and states may go beyond it has been said, for example, by Ruth uh, or Kerigi. Um, but this appendix only applies to printed works, like the Bern appendix, only to printed works, not digital works. So its use for that reason is, is in a sense limited. And the Bern appendix um, only applies uh, to very specific purposes, including education, but only formal education. So not, for example, education that is informal. The question is whether uh, this appendix here um, would be interpreted in the same way. Hopefully not. So um, perhaps just one final uh, slide that I want to show here. Um, okay, now I'm struggling to get this done um, to maybe conclude the session with. One could also have perhaps wished for other provisions uh, on translation uh, here. Um, I say here, make suggestions that, that could have been used. For example, uh, uh, this um, a time limit scheme of 10 years or five years could have been used in South Africa law, has not been opted for. The last point I make here about the fair use of fair dealing, I say that actually in as far as neglected languages is, are concerned, the three-step test does not apply. Now, if you wonder why, uh, then you would have to read this article, which is forthcoming in the next week or so, um, where I talk about uh, translating educational and cultural literacy works under Bern, Eos Corgans, and linguistic genocide, specific argument um, that I make. And I they say that uh, international copyright law, in certain respects, in as far as neglected languages is concerned, uh, actually contravenes Eos Corgans, and for that reason, well, is void, which means three-step test also doesn't apply anymore. Uh, a bit audacious, I, I, I agree, but on that point, um, Sanya, I hand back to you. Thank you so much, Klaus. Uh, it's, it's exciting to hear ambitious arguments about three-step test. Um, just when you think you've heard it all, there's something new that comes your way. <laughs> Um, no, but really, thank you so much to both Tobias and Klaus for your really fascinating presentations. We've got about nine minutes for Q&A. Um, I'd like to open the floor to our participants in the online Zoom room. Uh, if you've got questions that you'd like the speakers to answer, please type them out in the chat or raise your hand and I will recognize you accordingly. At the moment, I don't see any hands and I don't see anything in the chat. We'll give it a moment, but I do, of course, oh, there we go. I see a single hand. Uh, Emmanuel, would you like to very, very briefly state your question? I'll un you're unmuted. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and also the amazing presentations. So uh, I'm joining from Ghana anyway. Um, I mean, we've looked at uh, the presentation have really shed light on the need for, um, you know, uh, children to actually learn in their, uh, in their, you know, indigenous languages when they are, they are in the primary and early stage in life. Um, what we have witnessed is the fact that um, there are some schools that really would need uh, to be able to get uh, content and education materials in these languages for, for kids. Uh, for the organization that I work with, we've been trying to you know, translate some educational books into these languages. Uh, but we still feel like those approaches probably is not enough. So we want to find out from the speakers uh, if there is any uh, specific examples of how we can continuously uh, produce more content in the, in the indigenous languages for, for, for kids, targeting kids in, in, uh, in primary schools across various um, African languages. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, it's because I hope you got that question. Uh, I see, yes, nods, great. Okay, uh, any more questions? We'll collect a few questions and then we'll give Klaus and Tobias a few moments to respond to all of them together. Just while we're waiting, I've, you know, Tobias, you, you ended your presentation on a very tantalizing note. 
the international law, the international copyright law provisions that relate to the Copyright Amendment Bill and specifically those provisions that you were analyzing for us. If you could just summarize your view on that, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, I see, a, a, so so that's another question. So that's going to, uh, both of you can respond, but it, it was directed to, to peers. Uh, I see Asra, go ahead and ask your question. Please be short. Good afternoon. I would just like maybe a little bit of insight to comment into how these laws or proposed laws will impact in the online space particularly. Thanks, Asra. Uh, speakers, I hope you got that question. It's about digital uh, spaces and um, how these laws would impact online spaces specifically. Okay, so I see that we've got only five minutes left. So I am going to go backwards this time. Uh, Klaus, if, you, if you're happy to go first, uh, perhaps three minutes yes. to one, and then to be yes. you have another three. I think uh, the two questions that we had, um, I can kind of uh, combine them in my answer because the first question was how, what can we do, do to accelerate the translation um, phenomenon? And the second one was about digital use. Now, the article that I wrote, um, you know, actually in a few years, it will be out, outdated because we are rapidly moving into the future of AI. And uh, something has already been written on this. You find mach uh, machine translation and it is getting really uh, better and better. So you might easily make translations, but then the question is, you know, these online uh, procedures that, uh, that you have to do translations, you could ask or argue that they uh, violate copyright on a grand scale um, because that is what is happening. And uh, so it means you must do something about copyright law because the reality is just going to outlive what is actually happening. So one article has argued that um, there is like an automatic license to do a translation unless uh, the author reserves that right. So that is a way of, of, of seeing it. So I think that is perhaps the future because... Um, you know, the younger generation, also in a talk I had uh, yesterday, uh, was speaking, speaking to a student representative saying that, uh, you know, our worries about multilingualism will be kind of solved in the future because students have access to AI that can do translations very well. Um, so it means uh, translations will become possible, but we need to regulate it in terms of copyright. So I think, Sanya, just one comment. I think you wanted to me to, to to make um, explain what what the point is I'm making in in that article. Uh, the, the point I'm I'm basically uh, making is that um, the provisions that you have in terms of international law, in as far as they make provision for translation, are not sufficient to help preserve languages. And you know when you say something is contrary to Eos Corgans, that's you know something contrary to Eos Corgans is of uh, a course void and um, I'm not coining the term linguistic genocide it has been done by uh, somebody else uh, Skutnap Kangas and genocide is one of the forms of Eos Corgans so one might make the argument that copyright in this respect perhaps violates uh, Eos Corgans I know it is quite a critical argument to make um, but uh, let now to be as give a chance to also say something. Thanks Klaus I'm excited to read the paper uh, thanks for sharing the the little blurb earlier on. I saw it was published at PER, PELJ, so I'll check it out there. Yeah, and maybe just to say we, we had a language and law seminar and I presented that in, in that context. And so there is like a special issue on um, law and language the first coming. It must be the next week or so. Great. Thank you, Klaus. Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so uh, also I want to, uh, those who can see the chat uh, also, um, tell people that uh, there is a parallel conversation also going on. Denise has also come in uh, and is sharing some uh, uh, some of her insights from the work that she has been doing. I also apologize. There's a little bit of noise now in the background. Sounds like a, like a school or something, but it's just my children that are having too much fun here. So apologies for that. Um, I uh, let me just, uh, in the interest of time, also tackle the question, uh, tackle the questions very briefly and in reverse order. So starting from from the bottom um, about uh, Azra's question about the impact in the online space. So first of all, I'm uh, in principle, I think the uh, 
the approach that one should aim for is that uh, that that laws are formulated in as tech tech neutral a way as possible. Because if you start to legislate in uh, in in a specific way that speaks only to certain technologies, you have immediately the risk that, uh, that this is outdated a, a few years later again, because some new technology um, comes about to which perhaps what uh, what you have previously legislated uh, cannot cannot apply so easily. Having said, so this is if you read laws, typically there is not like uh, um, like a, like a great distinction with, uh, made between different types of technologies. However, obviously online is a big uh, big big shift. Uh, that we have seen, especially since the 1970s, when our current Copyright Act was was drafted, and as a result, um, uh, we are facing many challenges to applying these kind of analog concepts and approaches to the online world. And I'm getting a lot of uh, questions uh, daily, actually, uh, from from those who are working in the online space and who just cannot make sense of what they see in the in the current Copyright Act. They just want to know: is it now allowed to to digitize material? And on what scale is not allowed and then uh, they have all these specific cases um and um and and it's it's one of my uh, least pleasant tasks because what i typically have to say is that uh, that i don't have the answer for that either because a lot doesn't have really the answer so i guess my 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 response to you is well it will help uh the copyright bill will help because it does provide more answers to these questions than we had previously it will add what is also kind of flying under the radar, it will add, for example, a couple of new rights for rights holders um, that are specific to the online space. Uh, I just, uh, when you saw me uh, writing down stuff uh, in between, uh, I just wanted to use the right terminology here. So the, um, uh, there are certain distribution rights and rights to communicating uh, materials to the public that are added uh, uh, to, to, to the list of rights. And that uh, these are these were these were drafted particularly with uh, with online environment and space. So certainly, again, think of my scale the, of the balancing on the rights uh, side. There is some uh, attention given, um, and uh, on the other side, I think it will at least for many users um, by um, by those who are in the business of digitizing um, libraries, etc. Um, it will provide some more certainty as to what's out there. What is not obviously everything could always be better, but I think it's a good first step towards more clarity in that. Sorry, I'm actually rambling too much. I said I'm going to do this quick, and I see we're one minute um, after four. Three step test. Um, so uh, the, what I, what I find fascinating is that this kind of uh, conversation popped up over and over again. Is if this is the first time that South Africa or the world is actually addressing this, and what what I just the shortest possible answer that I can actually give is just do just look what the Australian Law Reform Commission did several years ago. They did it over, I think, 18 months, a year and a half or something. They had, if I'm not mistaken, probably a thousand or so submissions on the topic. They, they sifted through all of this. They analyzed that extensively. And on the basis of all of this, they concluded ultimately that fair use, a fair use provision like the one that South Africa is now putting forward, is compliant with the three-step test. And they provide also reasons for that. But one reason being that some of the countries that are now complaining about the fair use provision um, actually have ironically such a fair use provision themselves and have actually stated previously that they feel that their copyright acts are fully compliant with, with the with the three-step test in, in international uh, co copyright instruments. The issue of specific case is another one where people say, how can a broad provision be specific? And I find the argument quite intriguing that people do say, well, in fact, fairness, if it is defined in the way that the act sets it out, is actually a specific case in it by itself. So it, on the, the first impression is that it collides, but actually, if you dig a little bit deeper, it does not, 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 not do that um, as, as clearly. And then there's lastly, also very helpfully, um, a newer, I think more progressive um, interpretations of the um, three-step test, like the ones uh, pr um, put forward by the Max Planck Institute. And I think if you're also going into that direction, and move a little bit perhaps away from, from the literal uh, reading of the three-step test, to like us, what's the purpose of the of the three step test in the first place? Um, it's it's easier uh, justified. And then the last qu first question I think was already tackled by 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 Klaus. Um, if the question was then uh, how can you produce more material in indigenous uh, languages? Uh, that is what I heard. I, I had difficulties to hear that fully. Then I think a healthy set of exceptions and limitations that you can use to do that 
is one contribution that copyright law could contribute to the fact that not enough material is being created in that space. So create an enabling uh, permissive um, legal environment for, for, for doing such translations is important and, and copyright acceptance and limitations are one tool to do that. Starting up here. Thank you so much, Klaus and Tobias. I think that brings us to the end of this really fascinating webinar. Uh, thank you to the people who ask questions as well. It's lovely to see an engaged audience. Uh, and until next time. So we'll come back in the new year with with uh, uh, more speakers on different topics, as Tobias hinted in his presentation and Klaus hinted as well. Uh, so yeah, we look forward to seeing some of the same audience members there as well. Bye, everyone. Keep well. Thank you, Tobias and thank Klaus. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thanks all for coming.